Thanks for joining us at New Life for this week's message. Our hope is that God's Word will prompt you to go and make followers of Jesus in your community. We encourage you to connect with us after the message on our website or on Facebook. You can also give online or in person at any of our services to help the vision of New Life to make disciples. Thanks again for choosing New Life, and we hope to see you soon. So as we get started, it's kind of week two. I didn't plan on doing a series on intimacy, but last week I liked it so much that I decided to have a sequel. And last week I told you that we're going to talk about this thing, intimacy, and it's going to be the first message ever where, as the stereotypical male, I talk about intimacy and talk about sex. And so last week I told you I am not going to talk about sex. We're talking about emotional intimacy. But then I thought, you know what? That's just not very new life of me. And so part two is for people who have small children, you might want them to leave now because if they have had a conversation with you or not had a conversation with you, that you don't want some middle-aged you know, slightly balding, pear-shaped pastor to have with them at this point, you might want to take them out so that they don't hear some things first from me that they should hear from you. I'm not going to get super graphic, but it is going to be extremely transparent. And so we're going to be preaching from the book of Genesis. If you have your Bibles, turn them there. There is a young man in Genesis, and his name is Joseph. Who has heard of the story of Joseph? Joseph is one of the most highly, uh, highly, Honorable men in the Old Testament, the, the creation story gets two chapters in the book of Genesis, and by the time you get to Joseph, he absorbs 13 chapters of this 50-chapter book. He is a total stud in the Bible, and what we're going to learn about Joseph is that he has no qualms when the rubber meets the road of taking a stand for God and honoring him with his decision-making, and it's going to be a challenge for us as a church today when it comes to this issue of our sexuality. I'm going to give a spoiler alert early because I'm going to hit on this throughout the message. When it comes to our sexuality and how we view scripture, we take a stand on God's standard. So no matter what the world around us is saying, we do what God tells us to do, and that's what you see in the life of Joseph. I was telling the first service this weekend, I don't have the kids with me, and so uh, Ann and I have been spending some great quality time together. We, it's, uh, we were kind of reflecting last night of how long it's been, so it's just been before it's just been the two of us, and I can't even remember. It's just been a long time since our kids got the hint and let us spend some quality time together. And so they're in Fargo. We're going to be heading up there this afternoon. And I did what any, you know, romantic man would do when they have a day alone with their wife. I just said, honey, let's have a Chuck Norris marathon. I mean, who wouldn't do that, right? And so because she's my wife, she agreed. And as we were watching this Chuck Norris marathon, something hit me. The reason I like Chuck Norris so much, who in here likes Chuck Norris? The rest of you need to get saved, but uh, the reason I like Chuck Norris so much is he always draws this firm line in the sand, and so last night in the early 80s, this movie take play, it took place, we watched two parts of this movie, it was part one and part two, and it had a sequel, and it had incredibly low ratings on Amazon, but we just ignored that and watched it anyways, and I watched him rescue these POWs in Vietnam, and he went after this Vietnamese war camp, you know, drill sergeant personality who was beating these POWs, and Chuck Norris has his life that it's seemingly at the end of the ropes, and and his life is threatened, and he looks at this Vietnamese prison camp guard, and he says, you're going to have to kill me because I'm drawing a line in the sand. I'm paraphrasing, of course, and I thought, that's why I love Norris. It's not just that he can do push-ups and make the ground move, right? It's not just that he's the toughest thing that's ever hit the radio uh, and TV waves. It's because he takes a stand, and there's something inside of us intrinsically, especially when we have the Holy Spirit living in us, that just wants to see a stand taken. We don't want to waffle on every issue, and he kind of makes it black and white for us, and he's really easy to watch, especially when you don't want to think hard because the plot is just that weak. And Joseph is no different. He's 17 years old as the story picks up. But the Bible paints him as a character in Scripture who's 17 and responsible. Who in here is under 30? You're all gone this weekend, but for those that are really committed, you're the Josephs, right? Here is what Scripture tells us, that maturity is not a number, that maturity is a choice. There's really not a a lot of talk in this this whole term. Teenager wasn't coined in the Old Testament or the New Testament. That's coined in the last 150 years, I believe. 
that you can be 17 and you can serve God, and that your maturity is not defined by an age, but it's defined by the wise decisions that you make as you decide, I'm going to follow God no matter what in my life. And so at the ripe young age of 17, Joseph is off to the big city in Egypt, not by choice, but because he's sold into slavery. And as the story picks up, because he has a blessing from God on his life and the providential hand of God is upon him, what we see from young Joseph, although he's a slave and should be working doing manual labor, he's instead brought into a very powerful man's house named Potiphar, and he kind of runs the house for him. He's young, but he's gifted. He has no sense of community in his new upbringing in Egypt, and by all standards, he's probably a virgin as the story picks up. We send kids in the spring into the fall off to college every year. Some of my friends at church here just sent their baby girl off to college. Probably the most difficult thing you can do. I've got nine years until it happens to Ari. I mean, the boys will be fine, right? But, but when I send her off, it's a big deal. And so I was thinking about this storyline through the lens of sending your kid off to college. And so Joseph kind of goes off to college, and as he enters into the dean's home and he raises to the ranks, he skips right through the dorm rooms. All of a sudden now he has this position of power, and then adversity comes his way. And by the first semester, as he walks into his you know, frat house that he's living at, the president of the college that he attends his wife wants to sleep with him. And so he has to take a line and draw it in the sand and say, I'm going to follow God no matter what. And what we see is that all throughout Joseph's life, God is faithful to him. And now here's the big question. Is Joseph going to be faithful to God even in difficult and trying circumstances where there could be an abundance of excuses in his life as to why he could fall? And so if you have your Bibles, turn them to Genesis chapter 39. This is a juicy, juicy story in Scripture. I thought it was appropriate on a holiday to give you a juicy story in the Bible. Genesis 39, here's how it picks up. Now Joseph had been brought down to Egypt, verse 1. And Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, so here's what it's saying, a big deal, right? Had brought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him down there. And the Lord was with Joseph. Underline that in your Bibles. If you have a church Bible, just underline it in there anyways and take it home. It's yours. And he became a successful man, and he was in the house of the Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. And so there's something interesting right out of the gate for this 17-year-old virgin who's following God no matter what. He didn't share his life story, but God's blessing was upon him. And for everyone watching, a lost world around him, including Potiphar, who does not know the Lord, he sees one thing, even though he's not saved. He sees that God's hand is on Joseph because of the integrity that he walks in and the blessing that's upon his life. And I want to ask you this question as we get started. If you're online in Rock Creek or you're sitting here in the sanctuary, do people know in the lost world around you that God is with you? And this is the point in the storyline where you put down your phones unless you're taking notes and you hear what I'm saying because I'm going to throw some stuff at you today that is right in your face and in your wheelhouse that you need to grab a hold of. Do people know by observing your life that God is with you? God prospers Joseph and look at how the story continues to unfold. Things look like they're going well, now they're going to get harder. So Joseph found favor in his sight, verse 4, and attended him. And he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. From the time that he made him overseer in his house, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in house and in field. And so in verse 6, so he left all that he had in Joseph's charge. And because of him, he had no concern about anything but the food he ate. And so this guy who's wealthy knows how to delegate Joseph takes care, at 17 years old, he takes care of all of his estate, and all he has to worry about is eating. Sounds like an American, doesn't he? Now, Joseph, underline this because maybe it applies to you, was handsome in form and appearance. And after a time with his master, master, or I'm sorry, I'm going to read that again, verse 7. And after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said this. Look at me. I'm not saying it to you. Lie with me. This woman is... A sneaky woman. 
But he refused, and he said to his master's wife, Behold, because of my master has no concern about anything in the house, and he has put everything he has in my charge. He is not greater in this house than I, nor has he kept anything from me except you. So he had one rule. Maybe this is a rule that you have in your house. I will share everything but not my wife. Potiphar's saying, here you go. You're doing a great job. You can have everything, but you might want to stay away from my wife. And I just had this thought that popped in my head that I can't prove, and I literally just thought it right now. Do you think it's possible that Potiphar gave that caution because he knew the character and nature of his wife? That's just like a gold nugget that you can stew on for the rest of the service. Everything I had, I could have in this house except for you. And then he says this. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against, are you following me? Sin against who? Sin against who? That's super interesting to me. Potiphar seems like a fair guy. By the world's standards, Potiphar's the one that's being generous with with Joseph, right? When it comes time for Joseph to make a moral decision Who does he look to as the person that he's offending? It's not Potiphar, and it's definitely not his wife. It's not the guards that are around him or even Pharaoh himself. When it comes time to make a stand, he says, how can I then do this thing? He's talking about Potiphar until this point. How can I make this moral decision against God himself who has consecrated me and called me out of darkness and into light when I am supposed to be a godly young man? How am I going to look to God and say, I'm going to do things my way and not yours? You think our culture is lost? We're going to get to that in a bit. Egypt was morally bankrupt. God was not in that culture. And all these people probably would have thought that these things were common stance. Joseph says, I don't care what anyone else says. I'm not doing what God has called me not to do. How can I have this great sin against God himself? And as she spoke to Joseph day after day, that's how sin works. It's usually one and done. He would not listen to her to lie beside her or to be with her. We're going to stop there. There's verse 10. I'm going to get very practical and in your business. My belief watching these things play out, and so one thing God's blessed me with, and I say this humbly, is I've always been, before I was ever a pastor, incredibly faithful to my wife. At the same time, I have seen many people fall. And so if that's your situation, God can forgive you. He can restore you. He can redeem you. He can redeem your marriage even. I've watched that happen. It's a beautiful thing. But something is so interesting to me in this passage about this woman. She is a very sneaky woman trying to seduce a young man. But very practically speaking, here's what I've come to realize. If your heart isn't right before the Lord, look at me, look at me. Man or woman, just put it in your own context. There is always a woman named Potiphar's wife around the corner to meet you where you're at. You don't have to be Joseph to land a Potiphar's wife. You do not have to be Brad Pitt, right, or Tom Cruise, or Michael Jordan. These are like the people that I idolize, apparently. You don't have to be them to find a Potiphar's wife All you have to do is be letting your guard down and let someone who's emotionally unstable and doesn't know Jesus or doesn't serve him and trust him with their life into your life with the wrong motive. And if your heart isn't right before the Lord, there is a great chance that you will fall with this issue of sexual immorality in your life. If you've been married for 20 years, you're not exempt. If you're single and trying to serve the Lord, you're definitely not exempt. If you are a college student, probably gonna be back next week on vacation this week, there are Potiphar's wives Right? In, the, in the context of men and women that are all around you waiting to pounce if your heart isn't ready before the Lord. Doing the right thing before God is not the easy road that's been paved out before you. It puts you in a minority class. And when it comes to the Potiphar's wife that is around the corner, here is what I've seen. She's going to think that you're perfect in every way because she doesn't really know you. And what I've seen that's so counterintuitive is most of the time people fall to Potiphar's wives. A lot of times Potiphar's wives or wife tends to be even less attractive than your current spouse. And very practically speaking, I want you to hear me say this, 
it usually has less to do with hormones and more to do with your ego being stroked. There's always a situation lying dormant if you choose not to follow the plans and purposes of God. And so G- Joseph's at this crossroad. And I want to challenge us as a church. Before we ever get to the situation, we have to guard our hearts before we get there and commit to saying, I'm going to follow you, God. I'm going to follow you, Jesus, no matter what. She persists over and over again. And Joseph says, I'm going to stand firm. Let's keep reading. Verse 12 says this. The plot thickens. She caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand. Fundamental mistake. And he fled and got out of the house. And as soon as she saw that he had left his garment in her hand because she was manipulative and conniving, that's my interpretation, and had fled out of the house, she called to the men of her household and said to them, see, he has brought among us a Hebrew to laugh at us. He came into me to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. And as soon as he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried out, he left his garment beside me and fled and got out of the house. And then she laid up his garment by her until his master came home, and she told him the same story, saying, The Hebrew servant whom you have brought among us came into me and laughed at me, but as soon as I lifted up my voice and cried out, he left his garment beside me and fled out of the house. Joseph was in a good old-fashioned setup. Never buy or drink the Kool-Aid until you've heard both sides of the story. Amen? She's manipulative. We have to be very careful when we're dealing with people who have side agendas or side motives. And so we don't rush to judgment. And here's how the story ends. As soon as his master heard the words that his wife spoke to him, this is the way that your servant treated me. His anger was kindled. And Joseph's master took him and put him into prison the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in prison. So Joseph gets this raw deal. He's sold into slavery by his brothers. Joseph gets a raw deal. He finally gets a break, and before he knows it, he gets set up by a woman for doing the right thing, and he gets another raw deal. But God's providential hand is over his life, and ultimately, because he follows God, his life glorifies God, and he receives a blessing at the end of this entire story that we're going to unpack today. But here are a couple of application points that I want to throw at you when it comes to standing firm. All right, how, what does it look like to be a Chuck Norris believer? You can quote that. Number one, Joseph's stance was God's standard. I've been stewing on that thought all week. I've never heard anyone say those exact words, so I thought that was clever, and I want you to remember that and write it down right now. Fill it in your blank. Joseph chose to take a stand, but he didn't just kind of take a stand without knowing why he was doing what he was doing. He wasn't making an emotional whim of a decision. This 17-year-old young man decided that when he was going to follow God no matter what, he took a stand and he said, there's a standard that stands above me with my morality, and when I'm called to do something, I'm going to do it for the Lord, even if it appears that I'm doing it to be a good person to other people. I'm not going to let culture dictate the decisions that I make in my life because I know the one true God Almighty. Right? The common response would be, well, I can't sleep with this man's wife because he's a good guy to me. He just bypasses that surface level morality and he looks right to God and says, God, you are my standard and I'm going to take stands that are contingent on the rules that you place before me because I'm going to follow you no matter what you tell me to do. And so what's interesting to me about that is that as I'm looking at my life at almost 40 years old now, I can tell you this, there's only one standard in my life that's never changed. Every other standard in my life is a moving target if it's not from God. Who in here is at least 40 years old? Raise your hand high. I want to I see my people. How many standards have you seen change? Keep them raised. How many standards have you seen change since high school? Things that the world would say, oh, that's not of God. Now, 15, 20 years later, they're embracing like it's God's word himself speaking it into their lives because they've allowed culture to influence their decision-making process. I was looking at a Bible study that our college pastor sent to me through text. I was was 
listening to a guy named Chip Ingram talk about shifting standards and culture. And he made this statement that I thought that was interesting. He said, it's not the worst culture we've ever lived in. There have been times, we love to think that, but there are times in, in history that have been more difficult than times we're living in, morally speaking. But he said this, and it's probably due to technology. He said, there has never been a faster moving target than our current culture when it comes to sexuality and immorality. In the last 40 to 50 to 60 years, things haven't shifted a little bit. Things have completely turned on their heads, and things that we would never even question in God's word, all of a sudden, we are questioning. Check this out. In the 40s and 50s, I know this a long time ago, but stay with me. I was telling the first service, I don't even remember the 40s and 50s. All I know about the 50s is there was poodle skirts, and uh, that's when the Fonzarelli was really cool, although that show came out later when I was a kid. But in the 50s, about 5% of girls and 10% of boys said that they were sexually active in high school. Fast forward now, 60, 70 years later, 70% of girls, 80% of boys, before they graduate from high school, are having a sexually active experience. Single digits, people living together. Now, more people, before they get married, are living together than not. Things are radically shifting. And so if you're a baby boomer, this, this really perplexes you. If you're a millennial, you're going, yeah, this is how it is. Divorce rates in the 50s were single digits. Today, over half of people that say I do end up at some point saying I don't. In 1996, evangelical Christians, that's us, just so you know, Divorce rate was actually 4% higher than the national average, and since then it's kind of stayed equal. And so we have this issue where we talk a good game, but we don't really live much differently. And let me just preface this conversation by saying this. I know there are extenuating circumstances. I know that some of you have tried desperately to hold on to your marriage, and there are things that have happened that have broken down trust at a level where there's really nothing more that you can do because it wasn't just a mistake. It's a continual sin in your spouse's life, and you've had to walk through that, and so you feel like I'm judging you, but just hear me say this. There is every walk of person at New Life. People have been married two, three, four times, coming into church, getting saved. People have been sober two weeks, two months, two years, and so we're not judging you. I promise you this. You're going to hear a message that you won't hear in many other places at this church. We're going to be in your business, but we're also going to be a place where you're not going to be loved like you're going to be at most churches that you'll ever be, to be at because we want to apply the gospel to our life. We want to set a standard but love you through the process, and it's not our standard. It's God's. Amen? Amen. Are we awake? 1987, 75 million people looked at pornography, or admitted to, right? And it was actually traceable because there's this thing that happened in culture. Now, you don't remember this if you're under 30 and you moved to Aberdeen in the last 10 years, but caribou wasn't always caribou. There was this place called Blockbuster, and Verizon didn't exist either. And so if you wanted to watch a movie and you didn't want to pay 20 bucks for it on video cassette, you would go to Blockbuster and you would rent it. And in 1987, when rentals were at their peak and you couldn't just rent it on your TV, you had to go somewhere to do it, 75 million people rented pornography. By 1992, check this out, write it down, 490 million rentals. By 1996, 665 million rentals. And what's so tragic about all of this is the Bible Belt, America, in God we trust, is the hub for producing the stuff. This isn't subtle change. How could this not be spiritual? How could the enemy not be behind this? Things don't change that fast. Now things have shifted to the internet where it's billions and billions. It's the biggest industry on the internet and second place is way down here. It creates more revenue than all professional sports combined. 40% of men in America don't just look at porn. They look at porn regularly. And so many of those men are then coming to church on Sunday and lifting up their hands. There's a sex therapist that Chip Ingram interviewed. She said, 25 years ago, my caseload was primarily men. 25 years later, it's 30% women. This is not just a man issue, right? Are we understanding that? We don't want to talk about it, and it feels awkward, but that's what it is. 
And so there's this huge shift that's taking place in the world around us. Every stance requires a standard. And so when we declare who the God of the Bible is, we're not doing so because we have some preferential view based on our political affiliation. We're taking a stance for who God is because he says who he is in the Bible. It's not us standing on a soapbox and being self-righteous. It's us submitting ourselves humbly to the Father and saying, my stance is your standard And whatever you say, I'm going to be like Joseph, even if I'm 17 years old, and I'm going to say, this wife is not my wife. This is Potiphar's wife. This image is not my image. I am going to make a clear decision to draw a line in the sand. Here's the second thing that I want you to write down. Here's a a word for our church as a movement. Joseph took a stand... And he gained a voice. One thing that we can ensure, and I've seen this in ministry quite a bit now. One thing that we can ensure is that when we don't take a stand, people can like us, but we really don't have anything to say. And so here's something both encouraging and concerning at New Life. One thing I have come to realize just by being in the community as long as I have now is I can't tell you that everyone likes us or everyone agrees with us. Hopefully they respect the fact that we're loving people and not just, you know, Bible thumping. But I can promise you this, we have a voice. I do not go anywhere anymore without people identifying me as the guy at that church, some of which have called, has gone as far to say a cult. I have no idea why they say that. I don't know if they feel threatened. I don't know. I swear there's no Kool-Aid in your communion cups. I think it's their Lutheran Catholic backgrounds, but whatever reason, we have been threatening to some people in the community, and it's not a lot of people. Like, I'm, I'm not saying we're, like, I don't want to blow this up more than it is, but I promise you I've heard that. When you take a stand like Joseph, you gain a voice. While Joseph is saying no to this issue at 17, it's a platform, although he goes to prison. As he goes to prison, he starts interpreting dreams, and when no one wants to stand up, Joseph in prison is standing up. When his brothers go to him and they need some food from the famine, he has a voice. Over and over again, he takes a stand and he gains a voice, and if you want to ensure that you get laryngitis as a Christian, the way that you can do that is to never stand up for what God calls you to do, to never draw that line in the sand. Right? The church as a whole, outside of this church, loses its voice because our lifestyle does not always match up with what we say we believe. He puts his money where his mouth is, and everyone around him takes notice of the way that he behaves. I don't know really when it st- started. You can make a case that the 80s weren't good for Christians. We had televangelists that were going to jail for all sorts of weird things. And by the time we got to the time I was in high school, our stats, our vital stats, looked incredibly similar to the world around us and how we engaged in sexual immorality and how we walked through the covenant of marriage. There will be one million children in this month in America who will lose their family unit to a two-parent home, and it's running rampant in the church as well. And so we get this laryngitis when we don't actually operate in what we say we believe. God's giving us a platform. And he's giving us a voice, but it's only going to be as effective and as loud as in our ability to walk in what he's called us to do. And so here's my last thing that I want to share with you before you can eat some pizza with a little Peruvian fireball named Osmar. Write this down. I truly believe this after now being with the same woman for about 20 years. Joseph's stance preceded a blessing in his life. And so what I want to tell you, if you're on the ropes or you're thinking about throwing in the towel or there's things that your spouse doesn't even know at this point because you feel ashamed at some of your moral failures, that there is a blessing in following Christ and being obedient to his calling, even when the short term looks harder than you want it to, and your next step 
possibly, probably not for most of you, is being thrown into prison for something that you didn't do. Joseph is absolutely blessed for his standard that's God's standard. He says, I'm going to live a certain way. And here's what's so beautiful about Joseph's life. He says, I'm going to do these things. It's not just about checking off to two or three Christian things that no one, uh, no, everyone knows you're not supposed to do. I'm going to serve God. I'm going to glorify God. I'm going to take a chance at every moment I get in my leadership to make him known. I'm going to operate in the power of the Holy Spirit in my life. And as I do that, because I'm serving the one true God on high, there's going to be certain things that need to melt away from my life. I don't have time for the Potiphar's wife because I don't want to miss out on the blessing that God has for me. There is a fundamental blessing that comes from living the way that God has called you to live. What if God's plan for your life was better than your own plan for your life? What if he actually knew things about your marriage that you don't even realize were true? What if he actually ordained this issue of sexuality in your life and he wasn't against it, he was actually for it and he had standards that were for your benefit? What if God actually knew what was best? I said this earlier, and I think people woke up when I said this. God is pro-sex. First command in Scripture to Adam, be fruitful and multiply. Adam literally looks at God, and God says, go have sex. He says, it's not good for man to be alone. We covered that last week. Man leaves his father and his mother They become one flesh, they're naked, they're vulnerable, they're emotionally vulnerable and connected. And so here's what I learned from Ingram this week. This was what was interesting to me. He said, there are three phrases, write them down, in the Old Testament related to sexuality and having sex with somebody. The first is, like David and Bathsheba, it says to lie with. It says that in this text. She asked him to lie with her. And so to lie with someone, if you read between the lines, I think we all know what they're talking about. When David lies with Bathsheba, he's sleeping with her. And it's described as this physical act in the Old Testament. The second is this. It's very much a physical description. It's fairly graphic. When a man would sleep with a prostitute, it would say that he would go into her. And so it's this idea of this is a physical description of an activity which we have dummied down in our own current culture that sex is just this act that has no spiritual connotation to it. And here's what the Bible says. In the Old Testament, in Genesis, what I read you last week, when it talks about physical intimacy, it says that Adam knew Eve. That's not just physical, right? That's emotional. That's spiritual. I know this person. I'm going to follow God no matter what, and I'm going to love them no matter what. And when we're 70 years old and 80 years old, we're still going to have a healthy sex life because it's not just about the physical, I know this person and I'm intimately connected to them and when I have this type of relationship with God and with them, he actually blesses my life and it is so much better than a 15 minute time of pleasure where I push someone on to the next thing and I'm gonna just go to person to person to person in my life. God's no stranger to this concept. He made these constructs. God creates even the erotic in the marriage, Proverbs 5.18 says this, May you, your fountain be blessed, and may you rejoice in the wife of your youth. She's a loving doe, a graceful deer. May her breast satisfy you always. May you be ever captivated by her love. God's telling us, I want your wife to turn you on. I want your husband to be your sole focus as a woman when it comes to this area of intimacy. There's this blessing in the uncomfortable topic. As I close out, I was thinking about how to close this message out. I just wanted to kind of give you some very um, practical things where you could just see what this looks like in our church. I always talk about my marriage because I'm not a polygamist and Anne's my only wife, and so I don't have much else to go off of. But I do look at other people's marriages, and so here's what I want you to know as we close. I feel like every pastor on staff gets this. Every pastor at staff a new life, even our stipend guys that are running heads of ministry, they get this idea of intimacy with their spouse. Now, I I don't know too much. I'm not trying to be weird here, but I'm just speculating that when I watch 
the people that are around me and influencing me, like Micah and Greg are in their 20s. They're, they're kind of like Joseph's, right? When I watch them in their marriage, they both flirt with their wives. Greg's wife is in church with her parents, so I'm going to proceed with caution. Micah, who I'm going to go see in a second, he'll say things like, yeah, my fiery redhead wife, and then he just kind of goes like this. He just kind of goes, mm. It's weird. <laughs> Mike is a strange guy. He's really funny. Greg, I'm around Greg all the time because God's called us to body pump together, and so we go to the Y, and when we're on our way to the Y, oftentimes Kendra will call him. She's, she's like a fireball herself, and uh, she'll call him, and they'll start talking, but they kind of have this flirty back and forth, which... I know they've only been married a few years, but I can just picture them as an old couple and still having that back and forth with each other. There's a standard there that you are my wife and, uh, you know, you are my husband and we're going to love each other and we're going to glorify God in this thing through the good times and the bad. And you can just feel kind of the tension that they walk in in their marriage. It's not always butterflies, but it's real. Greg came to work a few weeks ago, and he said, man, I, something happened with Kendra. I really ticked her off. And she's like 75 pounds. She's just this little thing. And, and he said, I said, what happened? He said, she said she was going to punch my lights out. <laughs> I was thinking because Spaceballs is my favorite movie of Dark Helmet with his lightsaber just trying to get a hold of that other guy. And she just, you know, she can't really do anything about it, but she's fiery. She has this passion and you can see that passion in their life. John, who we're voting on today, who's been a mentor to all of us, he loves his wife. His kids are friends with our staff, and his youngest was saying, yeah, my dad a few months ago, in front of all of us kids who were home for a holiday, said, Beth, I just want you to jump in my arms. I love you. And she jumped in his arms in the kitchen in front of the kids, and he dropped her. It's really a bad story. You have to talk to him. I don't want to share his business. I, I try to keep everything confidential from the pulpit. <laughs> Chuck met his wife a long time ago at KFC. She was his boss, and the tension has existed ever since. She calls Chuck, and she says, Hogo! I can hear her through the phone sometimes. I've been with my wife for since... I was 19. I watched Chuck Norris movies with her, and I'm about to go see her in just a second singing. She just does it for me. She's a good woman. And we go through hard times, we go through good times, but in all times, Jesus is at the center, right? And I want to encourage you with that. You can be your wife's Chuck Norris. Pursue the blessing that comes with setting yourself apart and saying, I'm going to follow you, Jesus, no matter what. When culture says one thing is wrong and another thing is right, I'm going to follow you no matter what. When the lost world around me says, I'm in charge of my own morality, I'm going to follow you no matter what. When those images are tempting to look at on a screen instead of my spouse, I'm going to follow you no matter what. None of us are without sin. We've all fallen short of God's standard. But today we can stand firm and say, you, God, are the object of my affection, just like Joseph at 17 years old. Do you know the father? Do you understand his standards? And look at me when I tell you this. Do you know the son who bled out on a cross in your place so that you can have life? Do you know Jesus? Have you given him this issue of intimacy in your life? If you're single like Joseph, stand firm. If you're married, get your priorities right. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your word. You and you alone are our standard. Everything we have, we give to you. We pray for marriages at New Life, that we would follow you no matter what, no matter what comes our way. That you would be the object of our affection, and in that, we would have affection for our spouse. I pray for our college students who'll be back next week as they are told that they can do what they want with their bodies, that they can sleep with who they want. 
that sexuality can be expressed by anyone, however they see fit, that it's not just between a man and a woman in the covenant of marriage, as they buy that lie and they drink that Kool-Aid, God, that they would hear the gospel and they'd be radically changed on the Northern campus, on the Presentation campus, on the Trinity Bible College campus. God, we asked that our young Josephs would stand firm in their faith and give you this area of intimacy in their life. We pray these things in your precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. Thanks again for checking out this week's message. If you have any questions or would like to know more about how you can get involved in new life, we hope that you'll reach out to us on the website or on Facebook. Check back next week as we continue to seek God's heart for our community.